Today, we are really pleased to be here with Aya Gruber to discuss her book, The Feminist War on Crime, The Unexpected Role of Women's Liberation in Mass Incarceration. Um, to give you a little preview of the book, uh, many feminists grapple with the problem of hyper-incarceration in the United States, and yet commenters on gender crime continue to assert that criminal law is not tough enough. Aya argues that this punitive impulse is dangerous and counterproductive. In their quest to secure women's protection from domestic violence and rape, American feminists have become soldiers in the war on crime by emphasizing white female victimhood, expanding the power of police and prosecutors, touting the problem-solving power of incarceration, and diverting resources toward law enforcement and away from marginalized communities. This approach exacerbates social inequalities by diverting more power and resources toward a fundamentally flawed criminal justice system, further harming victims, perpetrators, and communities alike. Aya Gruber is professor of law at the University of Colorado Law School. A former public defender, she is a frequent commentator on criminal justice issues. She's appeared on ABC, NBC, and PBS, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, Denver Post, and Associated Press. And that is it from me. Thank you all so much for being here. Aya, congratulations on the book and welcome. Well, thank you so much. I have to say that I'm absolutely delighted to be there. This is the first time I'm gonna actually read excerpts of the book. I um, have been doing presentations and podcasts, but so far not a reading. And I'm really excited to do it in Haight-Ashbury where I used to live many moons ago. Um, and I'm just uh, very happy to support uh, independent booksellers. And I also just want to thank you all for coming. This is a difficult time and I know there are a lot of demands on your time and a lot of interesting things going on in the world. So to make time to come here and be with me is great. And I just recognize that I am so uh, privileged uh, to be able to be doing this event right now um, when so many people are suffering and I'm cognizant of that. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, I think I'll just start by reading a little from the introduction to give you a sense of the struggle I've had, uh, arguably even a lifelong struggle with the question of the role of criminal law, uh, the criminal system and imprisonment in helping women achieve gender justice. Um, but I started in law school, which was a long time ago. So when I was a law student and aspiring criminal lawyer, I always felt mired in a feminist defense attorney dilemma. On the one hand, I was intimately familiar with the harms of sexual assault and firmly believed that gender crimes reflected and reinforced women's second-class status. On the other, I was involved in public defense and anti-incarceration work. And I had come to regard the prison as a primary site of violence, racism, and degradation in society. I faithfully studied and trained to represent indigent defendants against the awesome power of the state. But I did so with a nagging sense of dread at the prospect of defending batterers and rapists. But that sense quickly abated after I became a public defender and witnessed firsthand the prosecutorial machine processing domestic violence and sexual assault cases. I felt a sense of disillusionment that the feminist movement I so admired played such a distinct role in broadening and legitimizing the unconscionable penal state. Cases like the following involving my client Jamal and his girlfriend Brittany made me lose faith in the possibility of feminal, feminist criminal justice. Subsequently, I continued to dread defending batterers, but I did so for other reasons completely. And so now I tell the story of Jamal and Brittany. It is the year 2000. I'm a junior public defender in Washington, DC, standing in the early morning courthouse, already buzzing with activity. Uniformed DC Metro Police lounge and groups swapping stories and laughing among the grim-faced confused defendants and their wide-eyed children. Inscrutable US Marshals with military crew cuts enter courtrooms accompanied by young gray-suited prosecutors. I wait for my client Jamal 
who at 19 is childlike to me with his teen Disney show face, neatly done up plaits and cool Nike kicks. Because of his immature penchant for missing appointments, I had given him my home number. He's the only client who has ever gotten that number. Years later, I entertain a hazy memory of his 4 a.m. call to say, what's up? Just as I will have ephemeral recollections of the bright orange plastic chairs lining the DC Superior Court hallway and the smell of late night sweat in the holding cells. Yes, Jamal will stick out in my mind, but not because his case is particularly outrageous or quirky. Jamal's case is notable for its similarity to so many run-of-the-mill domestic violence cases that do not make headlines. I'm at the courthouse for the Civil Protection Order, or CPO, portion of Jamal's case. Jamal was arrested 10 days earlier after his 18-year-old girlfriend, Brittany, reported that he punched her and threw a plate at her. Prosecutors have lately been adopting the tactic of subpoenaing domestic violence defendants to testify at these quasi-civil hearings without notice to their attorneys. Much can be at stake with a CPO, such as loss of one's home, expansive stay-away restrictions, alcohol abstention, and loss of parental rights for up to two years. Defendants often attended the hearings unrepresented, and if they refused to testify, judges summarily issued the onerous protection orders. Worse, some defendants took the stand and subjected themselves to rigorous cross-examination without ever consulting an attorney or understanding the right to remain silent. I am here to make sure that does not happen to Jamal. A few minutes before we enter the courtroom, Brittany shuffles up. She is equally cute and colorful, squeezed into stretch jeans with platform flip-flops and yellow shoulder-length braids. She asks if I'm Jamal's attorney, and I reply in the affirmative. She says, quote, the other lady told me I have to be here, but I didn't want to come. She goes on to explain that she and Jamal live together with their baby in a project called Lincoln Heights, a place, incidentally, where a young man like Jamal is lucky to make it to age 19 without a severe criminal record. Brittany tells me that she called the police only because, quote, I was mad and wanted him out of the house. Even if Brittany preferred the police not to arrest, police had to do so under DC's mandatory arrest law. Brittany explains that she does not want to pursue charges and will not comply with the no contact order. Then in a more hushed tone, she asked, what if I just leave and stay gone? Will they drop the case? So here I am straddling the line between zealous advocacy and obstruction of justice. The answer to Brittany's question is likely yes, given that judges routinely dis dismiss cases when victims fail to appear on the trial date. By this point of my life as a public defender, I am used to domestic violence victims asking what will happen to their boyfriends in court, how they can spare them from jail, and the like. I could give Brittany a realistic assessment of the DV court process, but I hesitate, recalling with distaste the time in law school a fellow defense clinic student advised his domestic violence client and girlfriend to marry so that she could assert marital privilege and avoid testifying against him. I say, I can't tell you what to do, but also mention that I can take a statement from her. Just as I'm finishing my sentence, a young woman rushes up and inserts herself between Jamal, Brittany, and me. She is blonde, no more than 24, with a hip haircut and an enormous diamond engagement ring. Domestic violence clinic student, I think to myself. She demands, what are you doing talking to my victim? And why is your defendant near her? He's violating the no contact order. From the domestic violence advocate's perspective, defense attorneys are extensions of abusive men there to intimidate and coerce victims into lying or disappearing. I tell the advocate that Brittany approached us to say that she wants to drop the case and stay with Jamal. The advocate replies, quote, I'm sure she told you that. 
Brittany turns to the woman and protests, quote, I don't want to be here. And she, pointing to me, said I could leave. Yikes. I'm thinking about a recent hubbub where a well-known defense attorney was frog-marched through the courthouse in handcuffs, accused of obstruction of justice for attempting to take a statement from a reticent sexual assault complainant. No, I told her that I could not give any advice, I replied defensively. But as you can see, she does not want to pursue this case. The advocate snaps, quote, well, we'll see about that. Come on, Brittany, we need to talk away from them. With that, she leads Brittany away through the sea of humanity gathered in the bustling hall. Ten minutes later, we're all seated at council table. I listen as the judge orders a renewable one-year protection order, including requirements that Jamal leave the apartment and have no contact with Brittany or the baby. Brittany keeps her eyes locked on the table below. I never get to take that statement. But the day before Jamal's criminal trial, Brittany calls to tell me she's not coming. She said she tried to call the domestic violence lady to drop the case, but could not reach her. True to her word, Brittany is a no-show. But instead of moving to dismiss the case, the prosecutor says he is prepared to go forward on hearsay, specifically Brittany's initial excited utterances to the police. Uh, incidentally, this is a tactic generally regar regarded as unconstitutional after a 2004 Supreme Court case. Jamal decides not to risk a jail sentence and agrees to a guilty plea and deferred sentencing. In Washington, D.C., first-time domestic violence offenders can plead guilty to assault and have the sentencing hearing postponed for several months, during which they must pay fines go on probation, and complete rehabilitative programs. If the defendant satisfies the condition and stays out of trouble, the case is dismissed. If he does not, he's immediately sentenced on the conviction. The judge defers Jamal's sentence for nine months, prescribing conditions including 27 domestic violence classes and 10 anger management classes at $8 a pop. A month later, I received notice that Jamal has violated the terms of his classes because he couldn't pay. We go to court where the judge finds Jamal in violation, enters the domestic violence conviction, and sentences Jamal to 100 days in jail. Jamal serves his time while Brittany struggles to pay for the apartment and the baby by herself. They never did comply with the no contact order. Jamal moves home after his release, but the couple eventually lose eligibility for public housing because of Jamal's conviction. The conviction will be the first of several over the next couple of years for Jamal, none of which were for domestic violence. As for Brittany, last I hear, she is moving from place to place and still with Jamal. So that's the first story I wanted to read you about one of the experiences I had as a public defender uh, defending cases in a um, really a prosecutorial machine, a carceral process that was built by feminists, by feminists who believed, like I did as a law student, that prosecution that the model of prosecution was the key to gender justice. Um, but after practicing, I found that that model produced far more cost and far fewer gains than I had ever imagined. So just kind of summing up the story, I say, when compared to evocative stories of women's torture and death, Brittany and Jamal's tale appears mundane. She was not injured, he faced a misdemeanor charge. But make no mistake, Brittany, Jamal, and their baby suffered brutality. The brutal conditions of entrenched poverty, racial inequality, homelessness, and despair. Brittany had called upon the police for aid in her domestic dispute with no clue of the unstoppable penal machine 
she would trigger. Jamal's criminal contacts put him in constant peril of incarceration and fomented his civilité mortis, his civil death. This is an American tragedy, representative of the many cases touched by feminist reform. This is feminism's tragedy. So I could stop there and take some questions, or I could keep going with some other passages from the book. Thank you so much. Um, let's, for now, do you want to move ahead and we'll, we'll hear another passage? Sure. Does that sound That'd be right? great. Cool. Yeah. So these are actually, so, okay. So this is kind of in the introduction where I'm talking about you know, my dilemma and how that quickly resolved, you know, as a practicing attorney. But now I sort of, um, you know, want to move to today's uh, dilemma, which I think, you know, for a lot of what I call in the book, millennial feminists, you know, they grew up at a time where there was really this um, maybe second coming of second wave feminism. So in the 2010, say, when there was increasing awareness of the problem of sexual assault on campus, and a lot of campus activism sort of uh, reviving the feminist label at a time of particular concern over sexual misconduct, then we see that kind of reach a pinnacle in Me Too. So there's all this political awareness of feminism and the problem of sexual violence on, on the one hand, right? Um, and the sort of natural extension of this side of millennial feminism uh, was calling for zero tolerance, where it's sort of a carceral move. But at the same time, the 2010s brought awareness, um, which really just, I think, took on a new life and a new meeting in recent months. And that awareness was of the Black Lives Matter movement. And this absolute, I would say, epidemic of police kill killings of um, unarmed people and disproportionately unarmed men of color and unarmed black men, I would say epidemic, but it was business as usual. And, and police brutality has always been business as, as usual. When you study it, it is not so much a, a malfunction of policing, but its function. So there's these two competing sentiments. And I think millennial feminists were interested in, well, you know, which way do I go? You know, I want to be a feminist. I want to take violence against women seriously. But also, you know, I know that uh, this, you know, feminists um, sort of relying on narratives of female victimhood, which all often translated into white fe female victimhood, were very successful at using the criminal law. And this turned out to be a poison gift. Um, so what I wanted to do in this book was really go back and say, how did this alliance between feminism and mass incarceration, how was it forged? What are the internal factors to feminism and the external political factors that sort of fomented these strange bedfellows? And then draw a line between sort of the feminist reforms of old and you know where they became very carceral and today's feminist reforms and where we might learn from the past, how we can sort of come back from this carceral feminist stance kind of being so uh, maybe disproportionately important in feminism and how, can, how we can do better. So the next story I kind of want to read um, is about the, how the feminist a crusade uh, right before the turn of the century, really starting in the Reconstruction era, in the late 1800s, and moving through to the pro Progressive era. One of the one of the main sort of ambitions of feminists back then, of course, it was suffrage, um, but the the movement for voting rights and for women's civil rights and political rights was very mixed up in this idea that women were really being oppressed by sexual and domestic violence. That they faced this, and it, you know, and it was a true idea, of course, these were, were gender justice set, um, sentiments. That women faced this double bind of sort of, um, especially you know, women of the working class being trapped in the home with the drunkard wife beater, right? The dissolute drunkard wife beater who subjected the woman to brutality 
right, inside the home or the double bind of being forced to labor under these horrific market conditions outside the home and, you know, the worst of the worst of that labor, according to feminists who were also largely moralists at the time, was prostitution. So prostitution was a, was a double whammy for feminism, right? Like the men would go out to prostitutes and bring disease and debauchery into the middle-class marital home. And also, you know, there was this narrative and it was, it was a very sort of spectacular narrative of women being enslaved into this white slavery and forced into a life of prostitution. And it was very interesting because a lot of the northern white feminists, once the abolition of, you know, you know, what's called chattel slavery, the enslavement of Black Americans, once that battle was quote unquote over, of course, we now know it is still not over. But once that abolitionist battle was successful, um, translating that anti-slavery energy into anti-female sexual slavery um, was very popular. Okay, so um, I talk a little bit about how the feminist anti-slavery crusade dovetailed with eugenicist and racist sentiments, especially in San Francisco. So, okay, one of the great, greatest barriers to racial and class solidarity with an anti-rape activism, and this is in the turn of the century, um, was the growing concern with white slavery and the new abolition movement. At the turn of the century, as the older suffragists and abolitionists passed away, the agenda of temperance and equal rights gave way to stricter social purity movements. By the progressive era, the narrative of the seducer who cajoled women into consenting to their own ruin had given way to the narrative of the slaver who captured unsuspecting girls and procured sex through punishment, not persuasion. Although evidence was largely lacking that the women engaged in prostitution were physically coerced, the vision of enslaved young white girls gave the anti-prostitution crusade an air of emergency and moral authority. Popular books of the time warned of the lurking dangers threatening girls and their oblivious parents. Um, and let me move on here. The primary racial imagery, imagery of sexual slavery involved white girls entrapped uh, by or sold to foreign men, low class criminals or ethnic minorities. Within this narrative, as was often the case with temperance narratives, the darker a woman's color, the greater her invisibility. By calling white slavery worse than, quote, Negro servitude because of its sexual nature, feminist activists collapsed the sexual violence in, exacted on enslaved Black women and men into less invasive labor harm, and simultaneously presented white prostitutes, often non-physical or financial and emotional constraints, as more dire than the physical torture inflicted on enslaved Black people. But these were not the only racial, racialized aspects of the sexual slavery discussion. Class had always played a distinct role in feminist anti-prostitution agitation. Temperance activists lamented that lower class prostitutes, although victims, were also perpetrators of harm. They tempted husbands into debauchery and brought lust and disease into the marital home. Such debauched women needed to be reformed, redeemed, and morally hygienized. This divide between prostitutes and their rescuers had a particularly eugenicist and assimilationist bent on the U.S. West Coast. In the late 1800s, as the Chinese population in California neared 25% and panic around the yellow peril was in full swing, Asians' perverse sexuality figured prominently in anti-immigrant rhetoric. Such sentiments were not confined to the West and are reflected in the New York Daily Tribune's infamous 1854 statement that, quote, the Chinese 
are uncivilized, unclean, and filthy beyond all conception, without any of the higher domestic or social relations, lustful and sensual in their dispositions. Every female is a prostitute of the basest order. California state legislatures pressed the, quote, yellow slavery narrative to secure strict immigration laws. One state newspaper remarked, quote, Chinese females who immigrate into this state are almost without exception of the vilest and most degraded class of abandoned women. These women exist here in a state of servitude beside which African slavery was a beneficent captivity, end quote. The moral repulsion for slavery met with hygiene-based fears of exotic diseases. In 1876, Dr. Hugh Tolan, founder of the University of California Medical College, testified to San Francisco lawmakers that Chinese prostitutes were the cause of nine-tenths of the syphilis cases in the city, and that his white patients, quote, think diseases contracted from China women are harder to cure. Indeed, the American Medical Association undertook a study on whether Chinese prostitutes were poisoning the nation's blood. Another drawback of Chinese prostitution, one pamphlet warned, was that, quote, commingling with Eastern Asiatics created degenerate hybrids. Meanwhile, social purity feminist activists worked to rescue the relatively small pool of Chinese women in California. Many of these Chinese emigres were bonded by contracts to be brides, second wives, or concubines, and regarded immigration even under such conditions as a chance for a better life. Historian Peggy Pasco makes the interesting observation that, quote, the highly skewed sex ratio in immigrant Chinatowns and the absence of established in-laws created unusual opportunities for immigrant prostitutes to marry and leave prostitution behind. But because of xenophobic stereotypes, policymakers saw Chinese women's degraded status as something cultural and innate. A San Francisco police representative testified to Congress's 1876 Joint Special Committee to Investigate Chinese Immigration, quote, these Chinese women have generally submitted passively and helplessly to this imposition, degradation, and slavery to be sold and bought and transported at the will of masters. By contrast, quote, the white women who are living a degraded life are not so easily handled. Law professor Carrie Abrams puts it bluntly, quote, if Chinese men were innately coolies, willing to indenture themselves into servitude. Chinese women were innately prostitutes, willing to do the same thing in sexualized terms. The narrative connecting sexual slavery to Chinese culture and character fueled the claim that Chinese immigrants were unassimilable. Legislatures vowed, quote, to pre prevent the importation of these female coolies. In 1874, California amended its laws to give immigration officials power to exclude a, quote, lewd or debauched woman. When the steamer Japan ruled, in, sorry, pulled into the port of San Francisco in August 1874, the immigration commissioner detained the 22 Chinese women without children on board, designating them debauched women. The detainees challenged their custody in the California Supreme Court, which upheld the regulation as valid state authority. The hearings were covered by local newspapers, which faulted the women, not for their excessive passivity to sexual slavery, but rather for their, quote, noisy demonstrations and obstinate and saucy backtalk. The Alta California newspaper reported, quote, the whole lot were jabbering and screaming at the top of their voices, and it was found impossible to quiet them. The San Francisco Chronicle further stated that one woman gave, quote, an awful screech, after which other bellow bellowed at the top of their lungs, forcing the judge to stuff his fingers in his ears and retire to his chambers. 
the interpreter explained to the reporter that the women were protesting, quote, being kept in prison, saying that they had not killed anybody, stolen anything, or set fire to anything. The women pursued their case in federal court, and the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Field, who was riding circuit in San Francisco, wrote an opinion invalidating the California law for usurping federal power over immigration. If Chinese immigration is to be stopped, he opined, quote, recourse must be had to the federal government where the whole power over this subject lies. Not five months later, Congress passed the 1875 Page Act, which forbade, quote, the importation into the United States of women for the purpose of prostitution. The Page Act was the first federal law to control immigration. And in pressing for the act, its sponsor, Horace Page, emphasized that China was not sending its best people. He stated America was China's, quote, cesspool because she insists on sending here none but the lowest and most depraved of her subjects. Like temperance crusaders, Page emphasized the need to, quote, place a dividing line between virtue and vice and send the brazen harlot who openly flaunts her wickedness in the face of our wives and daughters back to her native country. Abrams observes, quote, the result of the enforcement of this newly federalized immigration system was not just a reduction in prostitutes, but the virtual complete exclusion of Chinese women from the United States. The Page Act paved the way for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which prohibited Chinese laborers from entering the country for a 10 year period. Following the Page Act were also various initiatives to control or prohibit prostitution at the southern border. The Page Act necessitated new systems of monitoring and investigating immigrants and a centralized enforcement system. And as one historian notes, the enforcement, quote, strategies, which were pioneered on Chinese women because of fears about their sexuality, gradually became extended to every immigrant who sought to enter America. As detention under the Chinese Exclusion Act increased, the San Francisco mission homes set up by Christian women's groups to rescue prostitutes doubled as detention centers. But no doubt they were a welcome alternative to prison at the dock. Well into the 20th century, newspaper editorials continued to decry uh, Asian women being, quote, bought and sold into a worse slavery than Uncle Tom ever knew of. Consequently, another historian observes, quote, yellow slavery provided a foundation for the development of an American anti white slavery movement. So I know that was a long passage, but I do want to just follow that up quickly. And then I, I swear I will break for questions with um, sort of a passage from, that was a passage from chapter one. And now I want to end with a chapter, chapter um, a passage from chapter seven, which I think connects that story to modern day events. And this is in a chapter called Endless War and a subheading called Yellow Slavery and Moral Purity Redux. In early 2019, the press was all a Twitter with the revelation that the police in Jupiter, Florida had caught Robert Kraft, the billionaire owner of the New England Patriots, receiving sexual services from two women at the Orchids of Asia Day Spa. The case cast a spotlight on the type of human trafficking interdiction that has become popular among prosecutors, many of whom claim to be progressive prosecutors and among police departments. In October 2018, Jupiter police detective Andrew Sharp became suspicious of orchids after he read posting about the spa's sexual services on www.rubmaps.com. He confirmed his suspicions by observing that only men went into the day spa. Sharp directed a health inspector to search the spa under the pretense of checking to see if the female owner operators 
or employees were illegally residing there. The inspector interviewed the women and took pictures of a refrigerator where the staff kept snacks. Although the inspection report did not find unlawful habitation, Sharp regarded the fridge as smoking gun evidence that prostitutes were enslaved and forced to live inside orchids, a brothel. He directed officers to follow men leaving the spa, wait for the men to commit any minor traffic infraction, and pull them over and question them about orchids. Apparently, several men admitted to sexual activity like manual stimulation. In January 2019, citing evidence of, quote, trafficking, the police obtained a sneak and peek warrant for the spa, after which they faked a bomb scare so they could evacuate the spa and install video cameras inside. For five days, officers monitored and recorded the activities in the spa in real time. The police arrested and charged 25 men with misdemeanor solicitation. Also arrested and charged were four women who worked at the spa. The owner, 58-year-old grandmother, Hua Jung, the 39-year-old manager, Lei Wang, 43-year-old Lei Chen, and 58-year-old Shen Mingbi, who gave Kraft the handjob and whose face is now splashed across the web. Announcing the charges in a televised press conference, State Attorney for Palm Beach, Dave Ehrenberg, began with the observation that human trafficking was, quote, modern day slavery and evil in our midst. Ehrenberg counseled, quote, the cold reality is that many prostitutes in cases like this have been lured into this country with promises of a better life. Ehrenberg reassured his audience that arrested women could be eligible for expungement of the, pros uh, of the charges or protection against deportation, quote, if they speak up about trafficking. However, when pressed by the media, Ehrenberg admitted that the case did not actually involve trafficking. Quote, there is no human trafficking that arises out of this investigation. This did not stop the New York Times from blaring the headline, quote, the monsters are the men inside a thriving sex trafficking trade in Florida, accompanied by a story about the spa printed in English and Chinese. The state promptly offered plea deals involving community service and fines to the men who had been secretly and likely unconstitutionally surveilled. The Asian female orchids employees, by contrast, were hit with an array of felony and misdemeanor charges related to prostitution and profiteering and faced a maximum 15 years for the felonies and up to a year each for the misdemeanors. And Zhang and Wang were charged with 26 of them. Unable to post bail immediately, Wang, the former manager, spent six weeks in jail where inmate, inmates asked if it was really her on TV. All the women had various bank accounts and assets frozen for possible forfeiture. Zhang's lawyer, Tamara Kudman, attributed the fact that her client was facing decades in prison to racial stereotypes of helpless trafficked Asian women, adding that the ORCID's employees, in fact, quote, were in their 30s and 40s um, and held multiple cosmetology licenses. To be sure, the discourse justifying modern day brothel rescue raids is disturbingly reminiscent of the yellow slavery panic of the late 1800s. Trafficking experts Grace Chang and Kathleen Kim write that today, quote, symbolically, trafficking has regressed to stereotyped images of poor, uneducated and helpless young women and girls forced into prostitution reminiscent of historical conceptions of white se sexual slavery at the turn of the 20th century. When Detective Sharp's colleague, Michael Fenton, also a Florida cop, applied for a warrant to search another Florida massage parlor, Bridge Foot Massage and Spa, Foot Massage and Spa, he stated in his application that the spa used a, quote, standard Asian model, meaning, quote, a place to operate prostitution under the guise of a massage therapy business. 
In 2005, the FBI, in coordination with local authorities, executed one of the largest prostitution interdiction raids in U.S. history, quote, Operation Gilded Cage. Between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. on a Thursday evening in San Francisco, 400 plus officers de descended upon Korean-owned massage parlors and businesses suspected of human trafficking. Quote, I thought they were going after Osama bin Laden, said a neighbor. There were many people running at full speed. I thought there was a terrorist attack. Another bystander saw the rescued women. There were 102 in total, led outside in handcuffs. By the time advocates for the women arrived, the government had already placed most in immigration detention. Officials had already begun sorting out who was a voluntary sex worker and immediately deportable, and who was a trafficked woman who could cooperate with the government and receive immigration protection. A San Francisco Chronicle reporter explained the status, quote, the woman can at any time decide to return to South Korea, although law enforcement officials could then declare them a material witness to the case, forcing them to stay in the United States without any benefits. Indeed, Chang and Kim reported that this was precisely what happened to one uncooperative victim. She was, quote, denied the ability to return to Korea and held in jail as a material witness on a human trafficking case. So, okay, I went a long time, so I'm happy to go over to entertain questions. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm just to get us started. I'm, I'm really interested in the idea that white feminism has instituted um, legal practices and and mechanisms that um, have been adopted, you know, so systematically that that harm people of color and even women of color. Um, are there um, in like in your research? Are there uh, models for other feminisms that you came across that provide like al alternative ways of getting at solutions to the problems that incarceration presumably was trying to address or? Throughout time, there have been alternate visions of what is possible. And what's so fascinating when you look at the history, um, you know, going back as far as the 1800s and then moving forward to second wave feminism that, that everybody knows about, which is kind of the like national organization of women uh, moment and the post 60s, you know, 1970s moment of a lot of um, agitation for equal rights and equality and a lot of law reform. When you see all those movements happen, you see alternatives, whether it's the free lovers, right, back at the turn of the century, or notably Black feminists, anti-poverty feminists, welfare rights activists in the 70s. And in, you know, I wasn't able to read this passage, um, you know, because of time, but I tell a story about the founding feminists of La Casa de las Madres, which still exists in San Francisco today, um, really on the floor of, um, you know, the federal government in front of the Commission of Civil Rights and their famous 1978 hearings on wife beating that really catalyzed modern, the modern anti-battering movement, you know, debating with a celebrated, you know, white feminist powerful judge about, you know, the role that poverty and white supremacy played in the oppression that women felt in their lives. And in fact, the men who were also committing the abuse felt in their lives. And the founder, uh, her name was um, uh, uh, Martina Segovia Ashley. Um, and actually um, a woman named Shelly Fernandez read out her remarks because she couldn't come. Told of the story of the murder of her stepfather at, uh, uh, sorry, of her stepmother at her stepfather's hands, but still insisted that even after this brutal murder, she understood this horrendous act as a final act of a white supremacist society determined to lead two people of color to annihilate each other. And, and the vigor with which sort of the more mainstream second wave feminists fought 
back against this notion mm -hmm. that poverty and white supremacy were also at the root was pretty strong. And by the end of these hearings and by the 80s, this notion that um, what sociologist Beth Ritchie has called the every woman, uh, the every woman notion that all women across the socioeconomic and racial spect uh, spectrum suffer domestic violence equally had really taken off. And then this every woman narrative sort of translated into an every white woman. And then it was every middle class white woman. And, and in fact, for that group of women, you know, you know, policing might have been able to work, but the social science consistently found that for poor women of color in already marginalized neighborhoods, inserting more violence and policing into the situation actually escalated violence, right? So the model really became one of patriarchy, patriarchy only. But when you sort of defined out all other social factors, all other inequalities, well, this, this, you know, patriarchy of men versus women became a very sort of white privileged model. Um, and, you know, absolutely there were fights there. Um, but, you know, these social programs and political programs of feminists, it's not just the racial aspect, they occurred within larger social phenomena from slavery and reconstruction to sex panic and the war on crime, right? So, you know, when the domestic violence and anti-rape movement was, was increasingly carceral, the whole of the United States was increasingly carceral. And there was this synergy and you, you, you know, you see it really very much with uh, the 1994 crime bill between sort of feminist anti-violence goals and then the, the just, you know, the political juggernaut that was crime control politics in the 80s and 90s. Right. That's really interesting. I, I wonder, too, if that, if, you know, the degree to which it's able to sort of facilitate white patriarchy is, is sort of a... Um, a reason that that kind of carceral white feminism sort of took off and became sort of establishment feminism, you know? Right, so one of the, the, one of the you know, conventional feminist narratives that I think has um, really allied uh, a very liberal progressive equality movement with the carceral state, which is so illiberal and, and anti-progressive, um, is this idea of historical impunity, right? And, 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 you know, as a young feminist, I heard it all over again. Nobody takes violence against women seriously. You get a slap on the wrist. This is um, something that um, has been tolerated, right? And so when you have that background, um, it seems like the act of criminalizing in and of itself is an achievement of gender justice, regardless of what, what it increases, who it satisfies or not, right? Because you've defined sexism as the lack of law in that space, okay? But when you go back in history, you know, rape was punished by death, right? And, and so there was, you know, and, you know, the lynching in the post-Civil Civil War South because, you know, winking, which was probably a lie, but winking at a white woman or disrespecting a white woman, I mean, that was like hyper punishment. So, you know, the narrative of, of impunity is very simplistic and it's not altogether correct, right? There was impunity in some spaces, spaces where, yeah, gender was involved, but also, you know, race class. There was over punishment in some spaces. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you think about like the temperance crusade, it turned out, you know, mostly to be young women who went to reformatories to present, uh, to prevent underage sex, right? So there were, there was hyper punishment and under punishment in the same space. And I think it's, you know, just a complex story we can learn from so we can break this notion that when you see something horrible happen in life, like people raping people, like Harvey Weinstein, like just, you know, you know, um, you know, terrible wartime raping, um, domestic abuse, when, when you see all these kinds of horrible gender crimes, you know, I think it's natural and impulsive to say criminal law. Right. You know, more criminal law, even though these are so highly criminalized that, you know, it, 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 it's crazy the amount of time in jail. Um, 
But if we can break that notion that law and particularly criminal law is necessarily an act of justice, I think we can think a little more uh, creatively mm -hmm. and less carcerally about how to address very, very, very pressing social problems. So, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make clear that this isn't a book saying, oh, you know, you know, like rape is no big deal. Although, you know, I do make the point, and I think it's a fair point, that if you look throughout history, there, there isn't a line so much as a spectrum between what was considered anti-feminist sex like rape and deviant sex like LGBTQ uh, forms of sexuality, right? Like, so there's also that going on, um, you know, and, and, and the, the, the face of the female victim has been trotted out in many repressive crime control agenda. Right, right. Um, can you talk really quickly, or not not quickly, can you talk a little bit about um, what you see as alternate pathways towards like gender justice? Um, yeah. Absolutely, I mean, we're, in a, we're in an amazing moment now, right? Where I think that, you know, um, people are really rethinking what our hundred year long investment in the prison state has bought us. Right. And it seems to have bought us a lot of oppression, disenfranchisement and economic inequality. And, you know, and I, I make this case in chapter four and I think a lot of political scientists and criminologists have made this, I think it also bought us a, a broken larger governance system because there was this concerted effort, um, you know, from the 60s on to portray crime control and policing, right, this what's, you know, what, what even today Trump is studying as law and order as the only valid form of governance, right? And so, you know, um, we, we've seen just a failure of non-carceral types of governance and a real success in carceral governance. If, if, if success means building that form of governance and just making it huge, you know, that has really succeeded. So I think it's, uh, I think people are increasingly realizing that we have to look at this systemically, right? So we're looking at policing systemically. Um, you know, why are people protesting George Floyd? Yes, it's because Derek Chauvin is, you know, a bad apple. But, you know, if you look at police training, and I've been through a police training where every, you know, minority man or even any, you know, civilian, they come upon the street, you know, these rookie cops learn that, that if they don't, you know, use force first, they're going to die. Well, then the entire barrel is a bunch of rotten apples, right? You're, you're, you are, you are rotting the apples, right? So I think people are realizing these are systemic problems and they're not as moved by what was so popular in the 90s, which was if you have the news and um, opportunistic politicians, you know, publicizing the most spectacular, horrific crime that one individual commits against another, nobody will ever make s systemic change. They'll just, they'll, they'll get really hyped up over the criminal system. So I think we're seeing a move away from that where we see a lot of young people saying like, we've got to rethink the whole system. And if you trot out the picture of a murderer, you know, I'm still going to want to know more about the system. And I think feminists can do that too, right? If you trot out the face of the most privileged rapist, I can still look behind the story. And in fact, in later on in chapter seven, I do talk about the Brock Turner um, case. I mean, I think he was progressive's poster child because not only did he commit the sexual assault, but he was privileged, right? He was a privileged actor. And we like to imagine that, you know, if we strengthen the criminal law, which the Brock Turner case did, it instilled a new set of mandatory minimums in California. Um, that we're just going to get at the Brock Turners of the world, right? Like, like irredeemable, evil, and privileged white men. And the reality is not that simple. So I think, you know, like right now there is a, an opportunity, and, and I really want to see feminists embrace it, to think in a new way, that we can recognize harm and not prescribe state violence as a solution to it. So what is the solution? The first thing I would say is, um, 
decreasing the power of dismantling, defunding um, the carceral state. I think that is a paramount goal because I think it, it, it hurts everybody. And, in, and, and once you do that, and, and the reason I'm leading with that is, and, and if you want to check out my reasoning more, it, it's a very short essay. I have on the gender policy report, I wrote a blog post on this. I think if you lead with the restorative justice alternative discussion, it might be a losing lead because I've seen it happen before, like in the 70s with domestic violence, where the alternative people will come up to the carceral people and say, hey, look at my you know, fledgling program. The carceral people will say, look at my 20 years worth of funding and statistics and established players. And they'll always win. They will always win. So I think we need to lead with dismantling. And once we dismantle, it opens up the opportunity for us to realize that that the the shelter funding the 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 distribution of wealth the um child care that people desperately need the cures to the illness right the the virus that's uh you know raging through black and brown communities these are not alternatives these are the mechanisms of fighting violence against women Back in the day, the alternative was the masculinist violence, violent carceral state. That's the illegitimate alternative, right? right? Everything else is the way it should be. I don't know if that makes sense. But so I do endorse, you know, the alternative programs, but I just don't like to lead with the fact that they're alternatives. Thank you. Um, we have time for another question, if that's all right with you. Yeah, we can keep going for a little bit, like, um, you know. Awesome. I'm going to read this from um, the chat. So um, Hannah says, I don't think you can ignore the fact that female rape back then was not about justice for a rape, but rather viewing women as property. Rape within marriage didn't exist, and if you could marry the woman after you rape her, there wouldn't be prosecution. I think it's an, uh, an inflation to say that white women historically have been able to pursue justice because it was actually just an extension of the white man's property and using that body as a tool to exert your power and control. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at the rape body of rape law from the earliest time of um, you know, the United States, um, through to the time that I discuss, it was far less about ending coerced sex or ending, um, you know, uh, uh, um, violent sex than it was confining sex to marriage. Mm -hmm. So all sex outside of marriage was punished and courts happily punished women under fornication and, and um, adultery laws. Um, and inside marriage, no sex was punished, right? So this was really um, not a sexual license monopoly to men. It was a marriage monopoly over sex. And of course, marriage was highly sexist. So this was in fact a sexist regime. But it would be a mistake to understand toughening up rape law back then as now as the solution to that regime. Because as you know, the rape law was exceedingly tough and happy to carve out, you know, a marital exemption. And then, you know, when it didn't carve out a marital exemption, there was probably a de facto mar marital exemption. At the same time, the criminal rape law was exceedingly harsh against lower class men, immigrant men, black men, right? And, you know, the other sex regulatory laws were exceedingly harsh against sex workers, you know? So I agree with you. There was rampant sexism and as well as classism and racism. And it wasn't just a white thing, right? Like race played a role in it, but it was also an oppression of women thing. My point is that this notion that because it was so sexist back, back then and it was all impunity, 
putting more criminal law into that space is by definition a feminist move. That, that's what I'm really fighting back on. So if you look, for example, you know, up until the late 70s, um, you know, the Supreme Court had never resolved whether you could have the death penalty be prescribed for rape of an adult woman. So it finally went up in front of the Supreme Court. And the ACLU um, authored an amicus brief. And the person who authored it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It was, you know, notorious RBG. And it saw the feminist view as opposing the death penalty for rape, opposing more punitivity in that space, because it argued that the exceedingly harsh punishment for rapes, right, much like the non-punishment for rapes, both of these reflected women's status, and particularly Southern white women's status as the property of white men. So this punishment, this, this death penalty for rape was not only a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow was not only sexist, but also a legacy of this idea that, you know, a woman's virginity and virtue is so prized, right, as a property of her husband, that rape must be punished by death, right? So, so you know, I agree with you. There's both sexism in underpunishment and overpunishment. We can find sexism in there. But I think what has survived as our country has become more carceral is only seeing the sexism in the underpunishment. Thank you. Um, see, I think we're getting close to time. Um, let me just check here. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're ready to I'm happy to take one last question to, to close it out. Yeah, let's say, um, here we go. Let me fish one up here. Um, can you, I was really interested by the, um, the, the samples that you read from that um, focus on the analogy between um, women's conditions and slavery especially in light of what we now understand to be a, a carceral system that was designed to supplant slavery in the US. Um, and that that's, that, and now that that's more of a, um, more clearly front and center in the conversation about incarceration, has that, I don't know, do you wanna talk a little bit about? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating, um, you know, argument that is actually made by a historian, and I just kind of am putting it here, how, not only just how easily the um, slavery abolitionist sentiment among feminists transferred to prostitution, but just how much, um, you know, a, there was a real Christian morality strain in it, so much so that even you know, those who weren't racist, it became kind of racist mm -hmm. because, you know, you had feminists and other purity activists, really, I read many of the passages, quite forthrightly arguing how much worse prostitution was than, you know, quote, chattel slavery, than the hundreds of years of violent enslavement of black bodies and extraction of labor, right? And um, the reason why was because of images of the importance of white chastity, right? Like, so it was like this racialized image and therefore like what's stolen from the woman through prostitution, it, it, you know, it, it's just so horrific that, you know, even if the prostitution, you know, many years later, you know, there was, um, and, and, and she was part of a movement in San Francisco, there was a, a, a very famous second wave feminist author. Her name was Kathleen Berry. And she wrote uh, Female Sexual Slavery was her famous book. And she said, you know, this slavery doesn't have to be bodies writhing under whips. It can be subdued business transactions. Well, what was so interesting is then, as in now, right, or at, at least as in the 70s, the idea of women subtly having uh, 
coercion or even social cultural pressure to engage in commercial sex, which, you know, I'm not saying is a great business or not. Like there are many pathologies that can happen around women then. And uh, definitely there are many women who suffer enormously under it, but that this is because it's women and because it's sex worse than like abject violence. And in fact, sexual violence, right? Like, like, like way uh, more painful, you know, at least physically, sexual violence. And so you see this happen a lot, even in modern day, where when you talk about violence against women, the fact that it's, it's women and the fact that it has to do with an inequality patriarchy, like makes it really bad. And people really don't talk about you know, violence against men that way. So what you hear a lot of is like, you know, women who commit crimes, they've been subjected to, you know, abuse and violence, and maybe they've been subjected to DV, and they should, you know, maybe not suffer under the carceral system. And I totally agree with that. I think a lot of women in the system have been victimized themselves. But guess what? So have most of the men and, and men of color, right? And, and, and they've been beaten to a pulp. And yet, you know, uh, f for a lot of people, if, you know, somebody is in a psychologically coercive relationship, if they're a, a woman, they should be spared from the carceral state from later consequences, which I agree with. But men can, you know, suffer beatings and beatings and beatings. And well, that, you know, that's just like men being men. So I, you know, um, you know, I, I think that that's just, you know, we've got to be very careful as feminists when we take violence seriously, not to buy into a, a narrative that can be, you know, both sexist in a way that it, you know, the, the, the victim culture type thing, um, and, you know, play into racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for, for yeah. everybody for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I thank you so much for talking about your book. It's awesome. I'm gonna drop the link again so folks can order it through the um, Booksmith if you want to. Um, free shipping to San Francisco and East Bay. What else am I forgetting? This is the third in a six event series with UC Press, which continues every Monday through Labor Day. Um, next week we'll be joined by Erin Hatton to discuss her book, Coerced, Work Under the Threat of Punishment. Um, Everybody, thank you so much for coming out in this weird, new, wild format. Um, Aya, thank you so much. Congratulations on your book. Um, and thanks for spending some time with us to talk about it. It was amazing. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.